Is the audio fine, sir? Yeah, audio is fine. Okay. Okay. So now let us see how we can solve an equation system. Uh, suppose we have a system which we express as ax equal to b. So we pre-multiply by a inverse. So over here we are pre-multiplying by a inverse. We get ix which is equal to x. And on the right hand side it is a inverse b. Instead of a inverse, we can write adjugate of a divided by determinant of a. <coughs> okay, so we get a matrix, a rather complicated matrix like this. This is the cofactor matrix or transpose of the cofactor. Okay, so the multiplication, see we are multiplying b1 with c11. Okay. Then in the second term, B2 into C21. Okay, so I, the I is changing. The first term in IJ, you can see that I is changing, J is always 1 over here. So we write B1 into CI1, summation of 1. The second one uh, row will be this into this. So C12, C22, you can see the first element is changing. J is always 2. So BI into CI2 and so on BI into CIN. And the, everything is divided by determinant. Okay. So X1 star, the solution value of X1 will be 1 by determinant value of A into summation of BI into the cofactor of I into I1. So this formula will give us the different uh, solution values of the equation system. X1, X2, X3 and so on. Okay, so it's a bit complicated for more than three order but uh, this is the method that we can that we use to solve equation systems. Okay. Now, uh, if you look at it carefully, xj is equal to 1 by determinant of a summation bi into cij. Okay, summation over i. And x1 will be, instead of j, we put in i. Uh, instead of j, we put in 1 over here. Look at this expression. <coughs> Now, if we take the Laplace expansion of the first column, okay, this is given by this expression. Okay, let's see. Let's do a, take an actual example and see. We are going to take a three order matrix. Okay. So we want to take an expansion by the first column. So it will be A11 into C11. Since we are writing cofactors, we need not bring in the signs. Next it will, it will be A21 and the third element will be A31, the cofactor of A31. Now, if, if we, we want, want to write, write it in summation form, what is it? What is changing? I and J, what is changing? I is changing. So, we put in I over here. And J is? 
J is always equal to 1. Okay. <clears throat> so you can see over here that a determinant, if you write it in this format, this is when we are expanding the determinant using the first column. Okay, so this is what we have written. Okay, now look at x1 star. x1 star is bi by c 1i and this. What is this? This is the Laplace expansion by the first term. Okay, so the denominator is Laplace expansion of A by column 1. Okay. Now, suppose instead of taking this matrix, we replace the first column by the parameter. Right? So now if we expand using the first instead of A1 it will A11 it will be B1 here it will be B2 here it will be B3. So what is the summation now? The summation is B i right look at this term and look at this term it is same so that means the numerator is the Laplace expansion of sorry of A by column 1 when column 1 is replaced by B. You have got it or will have a look at it carefully. Then if necessary I will explain it again. Yes. Why are we dividing? Why are you? Oh, now this is a problem. I can't hear you properly. Uh, can you speak a little bit louder, please? Why are you dividing the thing? Like x equals to i sigma b one c i j. Okay, you mean this expression? You mean this one? Yeah, because this is the, uh, we have got from this, uh, uh, from over here that xj is equal to this thing. Okay, or x1 is equal to this one, right? Now, what is determinant of A? We can write it in this way. I've copied the numerator and instead of the denominator, which is determinant of A, I have just used written the Laplace expansion. Yes, sir. To some extent, it is, uh, I mean, you can just keep it as determinant of A also. It does not matter. But uh, one advantage is that uh, it is easier to compare.
okay so let us see using a example suppose we have an equation Let's say this is 0 and let us say this is 2. Okay, so what is the equation system? 3, 2, minus 1. What is the second row? 1, minus 2, 2. Thank you. And the third row? 0, 0, 7, 1. So, this is A. This is X. And we have B is 4, 0, 2. Okay. Okay. So, x1 will be, let's do the denominator first. We take the determinant, okay. So, that means this is the determinant of a. 3, 2, minus 1, 1, minus 2, 2, 0, 7, minus 2, okay. The numerator is this same determinant, but because we are solving for x1, we don't take the first column. Okay, so let me copy the remainder. Instead of the first column, we bring in this. and then we can solve it. So, what will be x2? Let me just write it down. What will be x2? Three one zero. This is minus one, two minus two, and now we replace the second column. Okay, so you can find out what is x3 also. X3 will be simply. 3, 1, 0, 2, minus 2, 7, and this will be 4, 0, 2. Okay. This is called, this method of solving is called Kramer's rule. Okay, see, the determinant value you have to find out only once, right, because it's same for the other two cases. So, once you find out the determinant of A over here, you don't have to find it out every time. It's only the numerator part which you have to find out every time. 
you have to find out this determinant the numerator every time okay so the matrix method uh, is easier in the sense that you get when once you find out a inverse let's see where it is once you find out uh, a inverse adjugate of a by determinant of a once you find it out then the math solution becomes much more easy you simply take x equal to a inverse b and this will be you are going to get terms like this so x1 star is c1 x2 this is c2 and so on so in if you use the matrix method the advantage is that you get all the solutions together you get x1 x2 x3 all together in Kramer's rule however when you are using uh, them you have to f you can you have you're finding out the each value of x1 using a separate determinant the denominator part is okay but the numerator part you have to solve uh, again and again but why do we use the Kramer's rule <coughs> in that case one case is that we have a large number of variables but we want to just find out one variable we want to find out just x2 for instance or just x3 in that case there is no reason in finding out everything we can just focus on x3 or x1 whatever <coughs> okay. So in the two cases that I gave you, um, yeah, what I want is uh, before coming to homogeneous, let us see whether. have an equation system can't find a solution mm. I can't find out the anyway I'll try to find out some uh, more uh, equation sets and give it to you otherwise do you have this uh, mathematics how many of you have algebra Algebra is not in the syllabus of G mathematics of this semester. Oh. <coughs> okay, let me see if I can get some other book. Actually, during our time, we had uh, in the part one exam we had both algebra and mathematical economics. So 
So can you repeat what you have said? Actually, your voice was cracking. Yeah, in our time, we had both mathematical economics and algebra. Oh, acha acha. So we had very good practice in this. During our time, most of the students used to, I mean, those who failed, used to fail in mathematics. And particularly, we had a paper. Uh, Forty marks was linear programming, which was very easy. Uh, Thirty-eight, in fact, and the remaining sixty-two was on dynamics, mechanics, statics, and dynamics. So that was very tough. And the only thing that we did was uh, there was a chapter called satellites. So we did uh, used to read up some theorems in satellites and hope that the theorem came. Okay, so this is an equation system, and you have to solve it. Okay, so how do we write this in matrix form? One, one to three. three. Yes. Then two zero one. Two zero one. Two minus one. Minus four. Minus one. Yeah. Four. Uh -huh. Okay, this part I can handle. Actually, if I have to yeah. look at it and write it, it, strains my eyes. So it's just not a matter of testing you also. Okay, this one is. One zero seven. Okay, so let's first find out the determinant of e. Okay, so find it out and let me know what is the determinant. You can expand by the second column. That will be slightly easier. <coughs> or if you can dictate it to me, that will be very useful. So minus seventeen. Okay. So can you find? Uh, I mean. Are the others able to follow, or will I derive this? Yes, sir. Minus seventeen. ठीक है सर. Yes. Okay. So you have got the determinant of e. अच्छा. Then, if we use the Cramer's rule, what is x one equal to? It will be divided by minus seventeen. But what is the determinant? So minus fifteen by seventeen. This one will be one two two. And x star three will be so minus thirty nine by seventeen. So all the solutions are minus. Very. The equation system. This will be two zero one minus one, and now one zero seven. 
this is also minus it is actually like 30 by 17 all are positive i forgot that 17 also has a negative sign oh all of them are positive <laughs> yes so i forgot 17 has a negative okay okay good because in economics if you just get negative values generally they don't don't mean anything but this is a mathematical problem so you might as well get it <coughs> okay, so uh, see the main thing over here is to find out uh, the in uh, the determinant value. Okay, so go through Chiang and try to solve as many determinants as you can. I know that uh, it will be an open book system. I know that you will have access to internet during the written exam, but uh, it's better if you yourself know how to do the sum. So, I have a question. Yes. So, the number of equations you will give maximum is? Wait a minute. I'll put it the other way the minimum number of equations minimum will be about 9 or 10 will it be okay for you no sir <laughs> then how many even more 12 so 3 at max sir <laughs> 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 so, so 9 itself is becoming the maximum <laughs> okay I'll keep three. Achha. Now, next we, the equation systems that we have considered is what is called a non-homogeneous system. Okay, sometimes B can be a null vector. In that case, AX equal to B becomes AX equal to zero. This is called a homogeneous system. Okay, now suppose that A is a non-singular matrix. That is, determinant of A is not equal to 0. Remember that we require this condition in order to get the solution. But if A is non-singular, what will we get? X equal to A inverse 0, this is equal to 0. So, X becomes a null matrix. That means, all the values of X, X1, X2, X3 will be equal to 0, which is what we call a trivial solution. I mean, in economics, if we see, in economics, we want to find out what is production, how many commodities you will consume, how many, what is the inputs that will be used. If the answer is zero, it doesn't really become interesting, right? So, we are not interested in trivial solutions. So, therefore, in case of a non-homogeneous system, A has, has to be non-singular. But if we have a homogeneous equation system, then <coughs> A will be, A will have to be singular so that we get a non-trivial solution. <coughs> so in that case, by Kramer's rule, X star is, mm, sorry, I haven't written the terms over here. Remember, so B is a null matrix. So, adjugate of A and into A is 0. And determinant of A is also 0. Now, this is not equal to 0. It is simply undefined. Right? 0 by 0 is undefined. So, this implies that we cannot get a unique solution to the equation system. See, previously what we had got was 
x1 uh, in what in your case what was the solution uh, something by 17 x2 was something by 17 x3 was I remember 30 by 70 what was the solution it was 1539 so these were the solutions that we had got in case of a non-homogeneous equation system that we had solved okay so over here we are getting a unique solution set but in case of a homogeneous equation system we get multiple solutions like for instance if we have got three variables maybe we will get 5 to 1 another possible solution is 3 0 4 a third solution is 2 minus 1 7 this is another solution so we have multiple solutions So we have multiple solutions. So in that case, this does not also help us. Because if we have too many solutions, we can't go for all of them. So we have to choose between the solutions. So generally what we do is we impose additional restrictions. For instance, I can if I if we say that x1 is strictly greater than 0 right so this equation system and we impose this condition the solution values have to be greater than 0 in that case what will be the solution over here what is the problem x1 is negative x2 is 0 so this cannot be the final solution over here x2 is negative here x1 and x3 are negative so the only possible solution becomes this one this is the only feasible solution Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, there is a problem over here. <coughs> okay. Uh, before that, let me just copy this. let us see that we have an equation system ax equal to 0 and we also impose the condition that x is greater than 0 right now after we solve for the system we are going to get multiple values suppose these are the multiple values that we are getting
which one will we choose third one why so what happens over here these two are a problem here this is a problem here this is a problem right so all the solution sets have problems so we see that the solution sets do not satisfy the positivity restrictions therefore we cannot choose between the solution sets using we are left without a solution this is also possible so this is a possibility and if this possibility arises then the equation system does not have a meaningful solution generally what we do is the co condition that we impose is this so in that case what we can it's quite possible that what we require is that the entire set has to be either zero or positive there should not be any negative element okay now it's also possible that even that cannot be uh, that is not obtained we have some negative value in one of the one of these cases okay. this also this is a common restriction in economics the problem is this may not be satisfied so mathematically we get some solution sets but none of them have any economic meaning for instance suppose that you want to find out what is the consumption basket <coughs> i give you an equation system and you solve it and you have got three commodities and the different solution sets that you get at least one of the commodity has a negative value so what is negative consumption <coughs> it doesn't have any meaning so that means none of the solutions i mean the solutions are mathematically possible but economically we are not getting a solution okay so over here uh, i'm just telling you this but i'm not stating the result there is a theorem called peron frobenius theorem using concept called eigen vectors so basically what you do is mm, if i remember correctly you take this equation system and you um sorry it should be lambda i mm, you form an equation system using lambda and you solve for lambda and the solutions are called the eigen vectors okay so there's a peron febronius theorem which shows that under what conditions you are going to get positive values but uh eigen vectors eigen values these are will be covered later on by md in your uh, i think fourth semester or even uh, i think maybe in the fifth semester so i'm not discussing this right now if you know that okay what is the problem that's fine 
you need not know what is the Peron Frobenius theorem, you need not know what is eigenvector, you just have to know that, that there is a mathematics which helps us to identify when we are going to get meaningful results, that is a bit advanced for you. I tried to t teach it once but it was a bit tough for the first semester. Okay, now we come to the applications. Okay. Now when we are talking about the applications, uh, and you have different applications but the most famous of them is the Leon TF input output model. Okay. Leon TF was a Russian economist. Mm. Do you know what white Russians are? <coughs> yes? Yes. Who was it? Who replied? Loyal to the Tsar of Russia. Yeah. So, after the Bolshevik revolution, the red Russians remained behind and the white ones, initially they rebelled, they tried to uh, take over attack Russia held by the other European countries, but then subsequently when they realized that it was useful, the Europeans uh, started, uh, they withdrew the support and funding. Uh, most of them went to spread all over Europe and quite a few went to US and then they became taxi drivers, they became, uh, they entered the hotel industry and so on. By the way, do you know the story about the blue ink and the red ink? What is it, sir? Okay. <coughs> See, uh, you have heard of the place called Siberia, I hope. Yes, sir. Some of you have been over there? Any of you? None of you? None of you? Okay. Siberia. Okay. So, uh, well, I mean, in Siberia, what happened was, there was, there were very the go Soviet government felt, communist government felt that there were too few people in Siberia. So they advertised saying that uh, if you want you can relocate to Siberia and if you do so then we will give you a subsidy. We will give you a housing allowance, a loan, to, uh, interest free loan to build your own house and so on. And they said that, look, Siberia has got a temperature which ranges from 18 degrees to 22 degrees throughout the year. It is a, there is no snow, there is no rain, uh, there is plenty of food, all of the best quality. In fact, you just have caviar, you have champagne, you don't even have water except for taking a bath. And you have lots of other nice things. You have shoes that fit. But there was a line, a complete line. So have you been to Siberia? No, but I know that it's extremely cold and there is extremely the living conditions are not that good. So the grass is green over there, you have trees throughout the year, beautiful, beautiful flowers and so on. So there were two friends, Ivan and Boris. So they read all the all these newspaper articles and they said that look, I mean should we go over there? I mean can we believe the government? So they thought that they debated between themselves, discussed it between themselves and they said no that we can't believe the government. So they said but it's quite possible, it's also possible that Siberia me maybe like this so what can we do so okay let us take a lottery 
and the person who loses the lottery will go to Siberia. And then after three months, he will send a letter to the other person and he, in that letter he will tell him whether everything that the government is claiming is true or not. So they took out two matchsticks and they took one and finally Boris won. So Ivan had to go to Siberia. So when Ivan was packing, uh, was going, getting onto the train, Boris went to see him off and he said, that, look, after three months, you please reply and tell me whether Siberia is really a heaven. He said, yes, but look, there's a problem. If I write to you, the letter will be censored. So if everything is really true, uh, then it's okay. But if I write that Siberia is not a good place, then the government KG, uh, KGB is going to capture me and jail me. So he said, yeah, that is true. He said, okay. What you do is, whatever you see in Siberia, you write that Siberia is a wonderful place. You write, you just copy down the government advertisements. Okay. But if what you are writing is true then you should use blue ink and if what you are writing is false then you should write in red ink so I will not look at what you have written I will just look at the color of the ink and then I will know whether you are lying or you are telling the truth so Ivan said yes that is a good idea and he went off so Boris waited, waited. After seven months, a letter came with a stamp that censored. So he was shaking, he was very tensed and he opened the letter. And he saw that it was written in blue ink. So he read the letter, he said, Dear Boris, I have been in Siberia for three months. The government is not telling the truth. It is even better than what they had said. The government wrote of a temperature 18 to 22. It is actually 19. It fluctuates from 19 to 20 every day. The grass is green. Everything is green over here. There are flowers all over the place. We have got campaign. We have got French champagne over here. We have got... Uh, the best caviar, the best toast, shoes are only by the best company, we have Coca-Cola over here, it's like heaven on earth. There's only one short shortcoming, we don't have any red ink. Okay. Good story, sir. <laughs> so I'm glad you like it. So let's return to Leontief. So Leontief was one of the white Russians. He went off to US and he was an economist and he made some very important uh, did some important work and but his most important work was on the input output model. This was a model which was very useful in planning, as you will see. And in the 1950s, when the planning commission was set up, in the second five-year plan, second and third five-year plan, this input-output model was used extensively by the Indian planners. Over time, I mean, everything loses favor, intellectual favor. So, the input-output model has also become uh, less important. But still, it is something which, at least the, you should know the basics of the input-output model. Okay, and this is what I'll try to give to you. See, in the input-output model, the assumption is they are in industries. Okay and 
their inputs are all produced okay so the first industry uses so let us say that the outputs are denoted by x1 x2 up till xn okay so the first industry uses x1 x2 up till xn as its inputs the second industry uses x1 x2 xn so that means it uses the output of other industries and its own output as inputs okay is it clear so uh, just repeat this part once more sir about the industry 1 and industry two. okay so industry 1 uses the output of all other industries what are the outputs x2 x3 x4 up to xn it also uses input. its own output as an input so x1 also is an input so that means in industry 2 what are the inputs x1 x2 up to xn and so on in addition to that the people consume we have a consumption vector so the con consumption vector is given by c1 c2 cn c1 is the consumption of output of industry 1 what is c2 consumption of output from the second industry and so on okay so let us say that x1 in the first industry x1 amount is produced how is this amount distributed part of it is consumed right so it goes to c yes this will be c1 part of it will be used as input, input for other industry okay input in other industries so i'll write this later on and input in the own industry right acha now let me define x i j as amount of ith good used as input in jet industry <coughs> so we are talking about the first commodity so everything will be x1 now input in own industry so i is one what is j over here <laughs> this is the amount of first commodity going to the first industry so this will be 1 1 right yes sir acha let us look at the amount of x1 being used in the second industry what will it be sir x i2 not i2 amount of first commodity used in second industry 
this will be x12 yes sir that's what i told you okay one. okay i heard i oh no no x1 used in 2 okay what is the amount used in 3 x13 and so on up to xn so we can rewrite this as x11 x12 sorry this should be up to x1 in x1 in and then we have c1 c1 is a con consumption by the consumers right yes what is x2 Plus X2 and I go up till X two n. I've got C two. So X n is equal to X n one plus X n two n n plus C n. Tell me when you have written it down. then we bring in technology we introduce what is known as the input output coefficients okay so suppose Uh, let us take x one two. Okay, we require. Okay, but before that, let us look into this. If you look at the column, what does the column sum indicate? It indicates. the distribution of output right what is the uh, sorry this is the row sum sorry 
Sorry, this is the row sum. <laughs> this is the row sum, but uh, what I want to know is what is the column sum? Sir, how a single uh, sector or a single part is consuming? Okay, it indicates the. input requirements of an of an industry c you can say c is obviously the consumption vector but if you look at this <coughs> x11 what is the first column the input requirements of the first industry this is the input requirement of the second industry so x11 is the own requirement x21 is the amount required from the second industry xn1 is the amount that x1 uses from the nth industry okay so mm, okay just let me write it down yeah what i'm saying is if you look at the first column x11 is the amount of the first commodity which is used as input in industry 1 okay so the first column basically looks at the input requirement of the first industry what is the amount of x1 that it requires what is the amount of x2 that it requires what is the amount of x3 that it requires and so on the second column is the input requirement of the second industry okay so over here let me add something j This is the amount that industry 2 requires from x1, the amount that it requires of x2, the amount that it requires of xn. Okay. So, when I am summing like this, it is how i, the ith output is distributed. When I am looking at it vertically, I am looking at industry j and trying to assess its input requirement okay now in order to produce let us say x2 how much of x1 will be required from this matrix can you tell me so what you told sir you could not get the yeah in order to produce x2 how much of x1 will be required sir x2 one No. What is the input requirement of X2? We have to look at the J. Okay, the second element. So that means this is the input requirement. Right? And what is the amount of X1 that we require? X12. Yeah. So, in order to produce one unit of X2, how much 
of x2 will we require? Sorry, how much of x1 will we require? This one, right? See, if we are producing x two, we require x one two. If we require one, how much will we require? Yeah. So this is what I've written. So let me define this as in general as x i j. So this indicates the amount of ith good. to produce one unit of the jth commodity. Okay. Okay. Now tell me that suppose you are producing in order to produce one unit of xj how much of xi will you require we will require aij yes sir okay if I want to produce x j units, how much will we require? x j into a i j. Yeah, this is equal to x i j. So, we want to use this and this. <coughs> the equation system can be therefore written as x11 instead of x12, I can use this expression. This is easy, all of it is same. See, this is x12. Okay, so i is 1, j is 2. i is 1, j is 2. This is j. So, what will be the third commodity? X1, okay, last one. Before consumption, and I've got C one. Okay, I better shift it a little bit. What is the second commodity? X2 is equal to This will be X1. So A22 into X2. A 
plus C2 and we can go up to Xn This will be x2 a n n x n plus c n. Okay. Let me know when you are finished. Now let us take all these t terms to the left hand side. equal to Cn. In the third step, see x1 and this one. We can simply write this as 1 minus a11 into x1 over here a2 minus a21 this becomes So, it is the diagonal element where you are going to have the, oh sorry, this will be minus mm, this is a n n x n equal to c n. So, we can write this in matrix form as A is the sorry, this will be what is called the input output. Uh, you can see this is the technology 
कोफिशियंट मेट्रिक्स C is the consumption vector. I, of course, is the identity matrix. See, if you take if you take this form, it's you can see easily that it is equal to one minus a one one. You will get this matrix. Okay, the in case of the diagonals, it's going to be one minus, but otherwise, it's going to be just minus. Aijs. Okay. So if we write this as B x, we have B x equal to C. That gives us the equation system, and now we simply have to look into the nature of B. So when will a solution exist? B is non-singular. Okay, and then we just have to find out the solution using B inverse. So x, the solution set of x is B inverse C. Sir. Huh. Sir. Uh, I got two, sir. Uh, what is that? Uh, that part, sir. The last part which you uh, told us right now. Uh, I minus A is that part, part. and the uh, and, and how, how is it coming, coming that, that part? Sir, the the last move. move. Okay. There is a saying: the proof of the pudding is the eating thereof. So let me illustrate this. Have you copied this down? I need a fresh sheet. What is the I matrix? One zero zero. Only the diagonal elements are one. 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 Okay. Right. Yes, sir. And what is E? I'm not writing the x immediately, okay? Uh, okay, sir. 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 A one minus A one. Second row. So the minus A one. Then. One minus A two one. A two one. Sorry. 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 Sorry, this will be a x. Okay, so if okay. I 
Now it's easy. Yeah, now I understood. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now this part. Uh, Okay, now when we are solving for the system, uh, we need semi uh, or rather weak positive. I mean, what is the what are the type of x's that we require? The x's has to be or equal to 0. You may have some product which you do not produce. In that case, it becomes equal to 0 or it should be positive. Okay. Now, when do we get this solution? Okay. So, there are two parts. One is whether a solution exists or not mathematically. This is purely a mathematical problem and the only condition is that A has to be singular so that you have a inverse matrix. Okay. So, for mathematical solution we just have to require that this is because it's a non-homogeneous system the determinant A should be non-singular but for the solution to be economically meaningful we require that all the x's are non negative okay now what is the condition for this the condition is stated for was derived by hawkins and simon and it is called the hawkins simons condition in their name see let us look into the i minus a matrix okay Sorry, this will be one, two. This will be one, three. Let us first look at this. Okay, what can be the sign of this? It can be mathematically. It is either positive or it is equal to 0 or it is negative. Right? Yes, These are the only three possibilities. Achha. If it is positive, what is A11? Uh, one one? Okay. A11 one one is less than 1. No, uh, what I am asking is what is the meaning of A11? One one? In this case, it is equal to 1. In this case, it is greater than 1. Okay. A11 one one is the bound which is equal to the form itself. A number which is only 
exactly if it is equal to 1 what happens suppose you have produced 10 units and a11 is equal to 1 remember it is equal to so if it has produced 10 units It has to be, this also has to be 10 units. So the entire output is used up by the first industry. You are producing 10 units, the entire 10 units is used up by itself. If it is greater than 1, Greater than 1 is this, right? What is happening? You are producing 10 units. How much are you using? No, what is the denominator? The denominator, this is x1. This is the amount that is produced. Right? Yes. So, what is this 20? The amount that you use as input. So, what happens over here? You are producing 10 units, but in order to produce 10 units, you require more than 10 units. So, will you produce such a commodity? Yes, I mean, in order to produce one unit, you will have to export it, uh, import it. The more you produce, the more you will get into trouble. So, th in this case, you have a surplus which is used as inputs in other industries and as final consumption. You have produced, let us say, 10 units. You are consuming only 2 units yourself. 8 units is left. You can use it for other industries and also final consumption <laughs> right so in order to get an economically meaningful solution what should be the value of this positive. this should be positive this was the first hawkins simon condition <coughs> so, you just need to know this part and understand this part. I am going to state the remaining part of the hawkins simon condition which is as follows. Sir, if uh, A11 is equal to 1, then also the production is equal to 1. What is the use in that case? Whatever you are producing, you are using it up yourself. Will it help the economy? No, the economy won't grow. Yes. The second condition is that all the principal minors should be positive. Now, what do I mean by a principal minor? The principal minor is this is the first principal minor, this is the second principal minor. The third principal minor is this.
and so on. So all such principal minors should be positive. So this is the first principal minor, this is positive. This should also be positive. The third order should also be positive and so on. This is the principal Hawkins-Simons condition. So I am not deriving the uh, principal minor part and I am also not interpreting this in details. Uh, very briefly, it basically means that mm -hmm. no, I don't. No, I don't think it's. Uh, if I explain it, you'll get confused. So understand the first condition: one minus a one one. The second condition, you should just be able to state. So, is there any questions? So, the okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, unless uh, see, what is the use of input output models? Uh, if you collect data on all the any industries that are in the economy, uh, you can plan out a consistent set of output. You can tell them that this is the technology in order, see sub, what can happen is one industry can produce too much, right? It will require a lot of inputs from other industries which they don't supply. So there is going to be an input shortage for the first industry. Okay, so basically what it, this input output matrix indicates is interdependence between industries. You cannot just sit and say, I am going to produce a lot. Another person cannot say that I don't want to produce. I will produce a very low level. All the decisions are interconnected. So if you are talking about a centralized planning system, you can... Uh, you can estimate an input output matrix solve it and then you know what are the outputs that are to be produced by the different industries so you can tell them that look if you produce you call x1 and you say that look if you can produce 100 units x2 should produce 200 units x3 should produce 150 units then all your plans are going to be jointly satisfied plus i have got some consumers they are also going to, going to be happy. Now the question is how can you ensure that they are really going to produce that amount. You can have a command and control economy. So you tell them and as in the Soviet economy, you can force them to produce that level of output. But there can be a lot of uh, very interesting errors over there. Um, there was a story, a joke obviously, that a factory was told that you have to produce uh, screws and the amount of screw what was the target the target was one ton per month so what the factory did was produce one single screw and the weight of the screw was one ton so theoretically the plan was the target that was given was fulfilled but can you do anything with a one ton screw? 
No, sir. It's a huge screw which even in Howrah Beach you don't require that large screw. The other way of ensuring this is indicative planning. So you don't force them, but you give them incentives so that they really fulfill the targets. If you fulfill the target, you will get a bonus or you will get some reward. If you don't fulfill the target, you are going to get, uh, you will get some sort of punishment. Not necessarily jail, your profit may be lower, your tax may be higher, something like that. However, it was also pointed out, uh, I mean, when you go to the, your fourth sem, you will see that this is also possible if the central planning board moves out, just announces prices. Okay, so the price mechanism can also ensure this. And what is the advantage of the price mechanism? Can you tell me? No, you are not setting the prices. It is the market that sets prices. No, no. In case of a pure market system, that what you have said, that is also possible. Mm. That there is a Langlander theorem which says that the central planning board just has to set the prices and then walk out. No, but in the free market mechanism, no one sets the prices. It's, it is demand and supply which sets the price. Yes. See, the advantage is, see, if you have a planning system, you have to estimate what is A11, A12, you have to estimate the input-output coefficients. You need a lot of information. And if your inform there's an error in your information, then you are going to make a mistake in your calculations also. Okay? Yes, sir. But if you are relying on the price mechanism, the price mechanism is functioning on its own. You don't require any information. You just have to relax. So this is the advantage. There is no scope for error. You are not collecting any information. So there is no scope of any error. But sir, in the planning economies, is, uh, is possible. As far as I know, sir, maybe wrong. But, but sir, in the planning planet economies, economies uh, the distribution of wealth becomes more equivalent than the market economies. Okay. Yeah, actually, there are two fundamental theorems of welfare economics. The first theorem says that if you don't intervene but allow the market mechanism to work on its own then the welfare of the economy will be maximized the second theorem says that it is also possible to ensure that the resultant equilibrium is equitable that is also possible without interfering with the price mechanism Achha, there is just one thing that I forgot to tell you. <coughs> uh, what will be the value of these coefficients? Can any of the coefficients be greater than 1? Any, any coefficients. Any of the AIJ coefficients.
what is AIJ? AIJ is defined as sorry this it will be j right yeah so if this is greater than 1 what does it imply suppose xj is 20 Sorry, how much of x i? Can this be greater than 1? Now can it be greater than 20? when i is equal to j we are we are talking about self consumption okay so a i i greater than 1 is not possible So when we are looking at the inputs, we are summing like this. Okay. So let us say this is point two. This is point four. Let us say there 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 are three inputs. This is one point two. Can we have an input matrix like this? What I am saying is, when you are i i j, i equal to j, then 
it's very clear that it cannot be greater than uh, 1. In fact, it will not even be 1. It will be less than 1. That was very clear. Let me tell you a point. Okay, just think about this and we'll come back in the next class and then in the next class what we are going to do is yes these are the input coefficients the first column So you can see that one of the input coefficient is greater than 1. Is it possible or not? Achha, okay. Yes. So this is something that we are going to consider. And the second is that look over here. Uh, in an economy, we require two types of inputs. One of them is a produced input, what we call intermediate. Like steel is an intermediate input for making automobile. Right. Coal is an intermediate input used to produce steel. But we also require labor. Labor has not come over here. It is possible to include labor. In that case, we can think of consumption as the inputs, input requirement of labor. Okay, so you have to, if you want labor, you have to provide them with food. So this is the input requirement of labor. So in that case, the consumption vector will disappear and we are going to get a homogeneous equation system. So in the next class, we are going to consider this type of economic system. Okay, so as... Uh, Another announcement that uh, I think MD will not possibly not take the class on Friday.